Um, welcome everyone to um, the eighth uh, lecture for this series. And today, very happy to have Robert um, from the University of Adelaide um, and uh, to speak about uh, his research in um, miniaturizing imaging probes. And Rob is a chair of biophotonics at the ARC Center of Excellence for nanoscale biophotonics at, at Adelaide. And also um, an entrepreneur who's the managing director at Mini Probes um, uh, company. And he started off, I guess, a couple of years ago. Um, he's got an extensive, you know, um, um, research and industry background, um, both uh, as a postdoctoral researcher at the Uni at University of Oxford, and and five years in the medical uh, device industry. I think Siemens is that right? And so I, um, I yeah. So I, I joined a spin-out company from the lab at Oxford that I was part of, and then then worked for a couple of other companies as well, including Siemens. Awesome. And and he's he's he's, he's, he's great and, and that that cross you know interdisciplinary uh, background uh, from Rob is what we're going to hear about today, and uh, we're not going into too much of his extensive uh, track of record. Uh, let's go into the talk. Yep, Rob. Right, Steve. Ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. So as Steve said, my name is Rob McLaughlin. I'm a professor at the University of Adelaide. Um, I'm also managing director of a spin-out company. <coughs> mini probes, um, which is looking to commercialize <coughs> some of the technologies that we work with. Um, oh, let's, excuse me. Um, so today I'm going to um, I'm going to talk largely about um, a particular imaging technology called optical coherence tomography. Um, so I'll give a, a quick cheat sheet on that so that you know something around that. Then the thing that I'm really interested in is some probes that we're making. So my lab specializes in making really, really small probes so that we can we can get poke them into unusual places and get them into people's bodies. And I'm going to explore that through a number of applications. The research that my lab does tends to be very translation focused. So pretty much any project we do will have a, have a particular medical disease that we're aiming for. So as we go through the different aspects of the technology, I'm usually going to do that in the context of a particular disease that we're working with. But first of all, let me um, talk a little bit about the core technology that's going to underlie this. This is a, a thing called optical coherence tomography. Um, so OCT, as, I'm, as the acronym is, as I'm going to refer to it from now on, is an in vivo imaging technology. So you can do it on, on live, live cells, on live creatures. Um, uh, informally, you can think of it as analogous to ultrasound. So in ultrasound, you send sound waves in, you listen, you hear the echoes, and from that you can build up a picture. OCT is based on the same idea, but it uses light instead of sound. So we send near infrared light waves in, we pick up the reflections of the light from different depths, and from that we can tease out a picture of what the structure of the tissue is. Um, the conceptual, so it's not fluorescence, it's not a range of other optical um, technologies that you can use, it's really just looking at the light that bounces back. Um, the strength of this compared to something like ultrasound is it's much higher resolution. Um, light wavelengths are much smaller than sound. So the typical resolution is somewhere in the sort of ballpark of 1 to 20 microns. So one dot on the screen is between about 1 to 20 microns. The weakness of, of OCT compared to something like ultrasound is the light just doesn't penetrate as deeply as sound. So we can get a reasonable image over one to two millimeters of tissue rather than looking really deep inside something. So the take home, kind of the take home message of all of that is with optical coherence tomography, OCT, um, you can see pretty small things, um, but you've got to be very close to them. Um, to go into a little bit more detail around that for the optics geeks there. Um, so we are looking, this is all based on backscattered light. I shine light on a tissue. Um, I'm measuring the light that backscatters back. Typically we're working in the near infrared. So our systems are either working at around 800 nanometers or 1300 nanometers. That's really just defined by what gets the best penetration into tissue. Light can be absorbed or it can be scattered. And there's this little window at around 800 to 1300 where you get the best trade off of those. When we shine light at some tissue, light will reflect back, not just from the surface, but some of the light will penetrate in and we'll get reflections from different depths in the tissue. Um, and really most of the guts, most of the hardware in OCT system is about teasing out what is the strength of the reflection from each different depth. And if you can tease that out, if you can say there's a really strong reflection from 100 microns under the surface, but then not 200 microns, you can put that together into a picture very much like you put an ultrasound picture together. 
The details of how we do that is we use a thing called low coherence interferometry. So we take our light source, we split it into two paths, so two identical light beams. One of those go and bounce off a mirror. The other one is used to illuminate the tissue. So we shine on the tissue, we get multiple reflections back from the tissue, and then we combine those two, the, um, that, the, the first one that bounced off the mirror and the one that went to the tissue, and then we use interferometry and, we, and from that we can tease out what was the strength of the reflection that came from each different depth. So really, most of the hardware is really just trying to answer that question. I had a whole lot of light reflected back to me. How much was it that came back from each different depth in the tissue? And then we slowly put together a, a picture. Probably um, more importantly for this talk is to get a sense of what is OCT good for and what is OCT bad at. Every imaging technology or every imaging modality can do some stuff great and is terrible at other things. So things that OCT tends to be good for, um, it's really useful if you're looking at, at structures that are at the scale of about tens of microns to hundreds of microns, and that's really just limited by the resolution. So if you're looking at things that are, that are one micron, OCT is not going to see anything, that's going to be sort of less than one dot on the screen. But if you're looking at, um, say, clumps of cells, so groups of cells, um, maybe some of the larger cells, like an adipose cell, then those tend to be in the scale of tens of microns to hundreds of microns. OCT also tends to be really good at looking at layered structures. So when that light is penetrating into the tissue, often there can be a, a change in the refractive index or a change in the scattering properties between different layers of tissue. So a lot of the applications of OCT are looking at layered structures. So that may be something like in an airway or an esophagus or a colon, where you want to know if the layers of the tissue are intact because maybe a cancer can disrupt that. So a lot of the applications around layered structures. Um, it tends to be, uh, and, and a lot of the stuff that's done in the eye, for example, that's an image of the eye down the bottom left-hand corner, um, is, is often looking at the layers there. Um, it tends to be good with specific tissues which have wildly different um, optical scattering properties. So a nice example of that is the picture down in the middle of the screen. This is where we were doing some imaging of looking at intramuscular fat. So we're looking at bits of adipose, bits of fat that are embedded in muscle. Um, fat or adipose are these, their cells, are these lovely big balls of lipid, which are fairly transparent to near infrared light, um, as opposed to muscle fibers, which is packed full of, packed full of stuff, which is, is highly scattering. So you can see in that image, there are, there are solid gray areas, which are the muscle fibers, and there's this other areas, which are sort of honeycomb structure, and those are the fat cells. So if you happen to have an application where the tissues you care about look very different in the optical scattering, OCT can be great. Other bits where OCT is useful, it tends to be very good for blood flow. There are some nuances that happen in the noise in OCT. It's this thing called speckle noise. It's a very sort of grainy noise. Um, and it has some characteristics which look very different in flowing blood to solid tissue. So there are some post-processing algorithms. These are called speckle decorrelation, which allow you to look at an OCT scan and differentiate blood from, uh, from sta stationary tissue. So the picture down in the bottom right-hand corner is a, a scan taken from some human skin. This is off a human arm. And we were looking over a five millimeter by five millimeter area. And by doing an OCT scan over that five millimeters by five millimeters, we were able to pull out the blood vessels. And in this case, see the microvasculature. So these are those sort of blood vessels that are from tens of microns to hundreds of microns that are just below the skin that are really important things like controlling the body temperature. So it tends to be very good for blood, uh, blood flow. Um, also, uh, sometimes OCT can be very good if you're looking at very highly ordered structures. So this is things like muscle fibers, where all the muscle fibers are in the same direction. There is a variant of OCT called polarization sensitive OCT. It's by it comes up with a measurement of the birefringence of a tissue. And very ordered tissues like collagen or muscle fibers tend to be birefringent optically. That means the light goes in different speeds in different directions. And that's something that some types of OCT systems are really good at measuring. Then there's what is OCT bad at? And, and there's an, once again, like most technologies, there's a ton of stuff that OCT is not useful for looking at. So it is unable to differentiate most tissues. Most to most um, uh, samples, if I look at it, everything's just going to be a mess of grey because the optical backscattering properties of most tissues look pretty, pretty similar. So a lot of applications that I look at, I actually won't necessarily see any structures. Also, it's not useful if I'm trying to look deeper than about one to two millimetres. Um, and one of the uh, things I inevitably find in OCT is I want to see just a little bit deeper, but I'm kind of really restricted to that sort of depth by the physics of what we're doing. 
So the work in my lab is um, very much looking at how we can get over that one to two millimeter um, limit. And the way we do it is quite simple. We make really, really small imaging probes that we poke into the thing we're trying to image. Um, there's two scenarios there, and a lot of that comes down to putting a, a tiny, tiny lens on the end of an optical fibre that we can feed into the place we want to image. Two scenarios there, we can be imaging in solid tissue, so this could be something like a muscle or a breast or a brain, and in that case we take this tiny fibre optic probe, a fibre with a lens, and we put it into, we glue it into a needle and we can stab it into the tissue. And we'll typically put these in needles that are between about half a millimetre outer diameter up to about two millimetres. So that's, if you, if you kick around needles a lot, that's about a 24 gauge needle up to about a 14 gauge needle. Um, you can make smaller. We once made a 30 gauge needle that had an outer diameter of 0.3 of a millimetre. Um, it was, uh, it was um, technically challenging. It was a very delicate little beastie, um, but you can make them down to about 30 gauge if you really, really push what you're doing. The other scenario is when we're looking inside hollow organs, so that's things like blood vessels and airways, um, and then you take that same miniaturised probe, but instead of putting into a needle to stab it into something, you put it into a transparent, flexible tube, a catheter, and you feed it in. And this is how you do endoscopic imaging or intravascular imaging. The concept's still kind of the same, make a really small probe, put it inside something, poke it in the thing you want to image, so you can see it from the inside. The um, details of how we often make the lens on the end of that optical fibre. So that optical fibre is about 125 microns across. We will make a lens on it largely by playing tricks with glass, by playing tricks with optical fibre. We will make a sandwich of different layers of different types of optical fibre on top of that. And if you put the right types of optical fibre and you get just the right lengths, you can control the light beam that comes out. So you can slightly focus it so that you can take an image. So to give you a specific example, if you look at the image on the right hand side, that's a schematic of, of one of our imaging probes. We have our, uh, um, our optical fibre, our single mode optical fibre that carries the OCT signal. And then really the magic is all on the end. So we might take uh, a tiny length of maybe 300 microns, a 0.3 of a millimetre of no core fibre. It's a particular type of fibre that's just, just clear glass. We might then put maybe 150 microns of green fibre, different type of fibre on there. Um, and then at the very end, we want to uh, often we want to look to the side. So we have a small mirror, which for us will just be another little bit of glass that we'll polish down. So for each of these things, the trick really is to get exactly the right length. And if I'm saying we're putting 150 microns of fibre on there, we're going to get that to an accuracy within about five microns. A lot of the technical challenge is doing it to that sort of accuracy. Um, because in honesty, when you're making these things, if you just breathe on the fibre, you move it by far more than five microns. So we've got very good at working out how to do this with, with incredible accuracy to make these sorts of lenses. As a sort of a, a moment of looking under the hood, there's a question of how on earth do you put 150 microns, so 0.15 of a millimetre of glass on the end of an optical fibre? Um, and the answer is you don't. What you do is you take a long length of optical fibre and you put that on the end and then you cut off all the stuff you don't want. So in the, the diagram here, um, the image up the top is we've got, an, we've got some optical fibre on the left hand side and we've got the, the green fibre thing we want to put on there. We're going to put a long length of that so we, we melt it on there, we splice it. Um, we then move the fibre back 150 microns and then we cut it. Then suddenly we've got this, this tiny little bit of optical fibre on the end. As in a lot of the Technical challenge is just doing that with extreme accuracy. But the hardware we're using is standard commercial hardware that's used in the telecoms industry for, for working with fibers. So when you <coughs> put all that together, um, we find you get good quality lenses. So the, the sensitivity of these lenses is sort of comparable to what you get with standard OCT systems. Um, the resolution, the imaging resolution of these things is typically about 10 to 20 microns. So it's not quite the high, it's not the high extreme of OCT, but it's, it's a great working distance. And you can usefully image over about one to two millimeters. The image, so in that down left hand, bottom left hand side, um, that's one of our imaging needles, is a 24 gauge needle. So I think the outer diameter is about 640 microns. Um, uh, and there's a little optical connection on the, on the back where we hook it into our OCT scanner. The image on the right hand side is uh, an image generated by one of these um, needles. This particular one, um, th this is a cucumber. I've got to say, cucumbers are fabulous things. Um, you don't need ethics approvals to stab needles into cucumbers. You can do it with a very easy conscience. One of the things we have learned in our, in our lab is that cucumbers, tomatoes, strawberries and grapes, they're fabulous ways if you want to get a quick idea of, of is, your, is your needle looking good and is your fibre probe turning in decent, uh, decent images. So 
that's that's a bit of an overview of OCT and a bit of how we make our small probes. Now I want to I want to unpick that and show some of the details there, but do that by going through a couple of examples. So one of the examples is one of the applications that we worked on, which is um, how we can incorporate these small probes for looking in, in helping brain surgery. A particular application we've got here is brain biopsy. So if you have a, a nasty growth in your head, one of the things the surgeons may choose to do is to put a needle in there, a large biopsy needle to take a tissue sample to understand exactly what it is that's growing there. And there's, there's a, it's, it's quite a common uh, operation to perform. Um, there are complications there. So putting big needles into people's brains can be dangerous. Um, about two to 3% of patients will have some sort of permanent damage. Um, about 1% of patients will die. I might point out in neurosurgery, those numbers are not too high. Neuro neurosurgery is, is um, uh, if, you're, if you're under the knife of a neurosurgeon, then like, you're not starting off in a particularly great place. So as far as neurosurgery goes, this is not particularly dangerous, but it's more dangerous than we'd like. And the issue there is if you put a needle in someone's head, if you hit a blood vessel, um, then effectively you've caused a stroke, you've caused a bleed. So we wanted to put a probe into a brain biopsy needle to warn the surgeon before they could before they hit a blood vessel. As I mentioned, one of the things that this, these, this OCT is good at is detecting blood flow. So brain biopsy needles, the way they're made up, they're made up of two needles. There's an outer needle, which is just this hollow needle. And then there's an inner stylet, which is a, an inner needle as well. And what we do is we replace the inner part of the needle with one with a needle with one of our imaging probes. So let's have a, a detailed look at that. Picture in the top left-hand corner, um, the, um, the blue and metal thing, the very top left-hand corner, that's a standard outer biopsy outer needle. And the, the, the bit with the yellow bit hanging out is our imaging needle. So that's a needle that fits inside it that has our imaging probe in it. If we zoom up on the top of that, we can see for the outer needle, there is a, there's a, a window there, which is where the tissue usually comes in through. And that's what we image through. And if you look at our imaging needle, there's a tiny hole there, which our optical fiber is going to shine its light out of. And if we zoom up on that, you can see inside there, there's our imaging probe, which is going to be looking out of all this and telling the neurosurgeon if there is a blood vessel right next to where they are. And so let's have a, a little bit of a zoom up there. You can see looking out the hole there, that's the, the imaging probe that we'd seen a schematic of earlier on. I might point out, um, Bigger needles aren't actually necessarily easy to work with. Um, we, we often work with sort of 24 gauge needles. So it's about 640 microns out of diameter, 0.6 of a millimeter. So that's about the size of a needle. If you're going traveling and you're gonna have a, a vaccination or if you're having a, any vaccination these days, um, that's about the size of needle you'd, you'd, you'd have. And that's what we often work with. These large needles, one of the challenges you've got is actually putting such a small fiber probe in the middle of such a big needle. And because we can only image over a small distance, you've got to make sure it's really close to the edge. So there, there, are, there are complications with working with big needles. So that particular um, project, we took those probes and we took them to a human trial. So we, we worked with 11 patients who were undergoing craniotomy. So they were having significant brain surgery anyway. And we tested our needle in on their brain to see if we could detect blood vessels. And we found that this, this, um, this worked really well. So we got a sensitivity of about 91% a specificity of about 97% um, for vessels larger than about half a millimeter. But basically we could really reliably see blood vessels that were right next to the needle. The, um, uh, that's, that, was, that photo there was taken during our surgeries. So that's a human brain that we're working very carefully on. The image on the right-hand side is the OCT image that was acquired as we moved the needle through. Um, you'll notice there's sort of a, a difference in texture on the OCT image between on the left-hand side where it looks all fuzzy and that's because there's moving blood there. And on the right-hand side where it looks better defined. And the image processing algorithms we use effectively analyze that fuzziness, that, that what that speck or noise looks like. And from that, we're able to automatically label if something's a blood vessel or if it's just some stationary tissue. Just to give a, a case study of that, um, one of the patients we worked with, a 69-year-old male, he was undergoing surgery, so resection, so that for a glioma, so they're cutting out a tumour from his brain. Um, Preoperatively, we identified a blood vessel next to the tumour, um, within the tumour, um, on an MRI scan, and we then put our needle in to identify that blood vessel. And so the OCT image you can see down the bottom here is kind of the, the story of that trajectory, the story of that insertion, starting from when the needle here on the right-hand side started going to the brain. We went through different types of tissue, and then eventually at the end, we were right next to the blood vessel, which we could automatically detect. Um, 
with the OCT that we're using there, um, as well as blood, there is some tissue differentiation we can do. So we can do some work in, in differentiating different types of tissue. Um, in the brain, there's a thing called arachnoid tissue, which has, has thin layers of fluid in there, and, and that has a particular characteristic um, shape characteristic pattern. Um, in the cortex, they would often get layers of tissue over there, like the pia mater, um, and we could, we could see those, and we could also see blood vessels. But a lot of tissues did look the same. So with OCT, for any particular application, always keep in mind, um, you've really got to sort of try it, and it matters on the optical backscoring properties. Some tissues you can really differentiate, there's a whole lot of tissues you can't. So there are only some applications this, this technology is useful for. Um, so let's take that a little step further. Now that we've got OCT fiber probes that we can put into needles and, and image things with, often OCT can't tell us the whole story. So it's useful to have other imaging technologies there as well. Um, and in this work, we were having a, a single probe, a single fiber that was doing both OCT imaging, but also fluorescence imaging through the same fiber. So this is a multimodal imaging probe. It's taking two different types of pictures through, through the same fiber. So the OCT was often seeing the structure of the tissue um, and we were doing fluorescence imaging through the same fibre so that we could see something about the chemical composition of what we we're looking at. And the trick to making a multimodal imaging probe, so one where you've got different types of fibres doing different, sorry, different types of light doing different imaging technologies through a single fibre, um, we use a particular type of fibre for that. It's called a double clad fibre. So a double clad fibre effectively has multiple pipes that the light can come down. Um, so there's a pipe in the center called the core, and that's what the OCT light goes down, and we can take our OCT image. There is also on the same fiber, a thing called an inner cladding. So there's a different path for the light, and the fluorescence emission light is collected through that. So we still send our excitation light down this fiber because we've got to get that fluorescence excitation light deep into the body somehow. But we've got this second pipe in the fiber that collects the fluorescence that comes back. And then there are certain optical components we can use that can split those apart. They can take, separate up the, excuse me, the fluorescence light from the OCT light so we can get create two images simultaneously. So let me show an example of, of that in action. This is some work we were doing at one of the local um, hospitals, the Women's and Children's Hospital, where they're looking at um, genetic treatments for cystic fibrosis, so this is a, um, a, an airway lung disease. What they'd done here is they had genetically modified some cells to, um, to treat cystic fibrosis, but as well, they put in the GFP, a green fluorescent protein, into those cells because they really wanted to know these cells they're using for treatment, where are they going in the airway? Are they staying in the right place? So by putting a fluorescent marker in them, in this case, in a, in a rat experiment, we could actually track those cells. So the image, the photo you've got on the top right-hand corner is the, the rat trachea. And this rat had been treated with these um, genetically modified, so fluorescent cells. The images you have down the bottom, we took with our, what we took with our single fiber imaging probe. So this thing is, uh, once again, this is only about 125 microns in diameter, the actual fiber itself. The bottom left-hand picture is the fluorescence picture we could take. And there are some green dots there, which are where the GFP, the genetically modified cells are. The image in the center is the OCT image, which is taken with the same fiber at the same time. And so it's really natural to overlay those so we can understand where these cells are going. Once we can put fluorescence into a fiber probe, we can actually start doing some more interesting things with that. So as well as doing uh, imaging with fluorescence, you can also, there's a whole lot of fluorescence sensors that you can start trying to work into your miniaturized probes. So a nice example of using that is uh, this particular one where we, the fluorescence sensor we used was a special type of glass. This is a special type of glass, which is doped with some rare earths. And those rare earths make this special type of glass fluoresce and the fluorescence changes based on the temperature of the glass. So this is the same design as we were looking at just before. It's a single fiber thing. We're gonna do OCT through that fiber, but because we've got this little dob of special glass on there that's glowing, based on temperature, we can measure that fluorescence. We can know the temperature of where the probe is. So in this particular, and the picture you can, the photo you can see there in the, in the very bottom there, that little, that bit, that curved bit down the bottom is the blob of glass, which glows. And in this instance, we're actually using that blob of, blob of glass as our lens as well. We use that to focus the light. So we demonstrated this in an experiment in a publication where we were looking at a rat brain, where we could both take an OCT image of the structure of the rat brain, and also we could measure the temperature at particular points. And the goal there was we wanted to use the OCT to make sure that we were measuring temperature at the right spot. Another example of that sort of thing 
is that if you want to look at other fluorescent sensors, not just weird bits of glass that measure temperature, um, we've done some work in creating a, a silk coating that can go on the fibre, which can hold a range of different fluorescent sensors. So silk's a lovely material to work with. It can be very optically transparent. So we put a, a transparent, so we can image through it, we can see through it. So we put a transparent coating of silk around our fibre. We then used, uh, developed a silk binding peptide. So this is a, a chemical, this is a molecule that both grabs onto the silk and also holds onto our fluorescent sensor. So we could attach a fluorescent sensor onto the silk. And then we took a particular um, fluorescent sensor, which is a pH sensor. So the fluorescent spectrum of this sensor will change depending on the pH that we're in. And we could put all that on one of these fibers that we are doing imaging with. So suddenly we now have a imaging fiber that can do an OCT image. And that's uh, on the bottom right hand corner, there's uh, an OCT image generated from one of these probes, um, but it can also measure the pH at the tip of the fiber. So in this particular application, this was an IVF um, application where we were looking at oocytes and we wanted to measure the pH of the oocytes because that told us something about their health. Um, but we really wanted to measure the pH really, really close to the oocyte. So we could use the OCT imaging to work out when we're very close to it, and then we could look at the fluorescence. So that once you can put fluorescence and OCT into a single fiber probe, there's just a whole lot of stuff you can start mixing and matching there. So the last bit that I wanted to talk about is a, a different approach that we've been taking to making these very, very small lenses on the end of an optical fiber, and that's using 3D printing. So um, there are, a range of different technologies for 3D printing. Um, the particular one we use here for printing things on the scale of an optical fibre is called two-photon, two-photon polymerization or, or multi-photon lithography. Um, you, in this type of 3D printing, you have a, a liquid called a photoresist. And if you shine light of the right wavelength on it, it turns into a solid, it crosslinks. And if you can turn a liquid into a solid in a particular spot, you can start forming shapes. So that's how a whole lot of um, printers like, uh, like a Formlabs printer, which are very, very commonly commercially available work. In this, we use a two photon process. And the advantage of the two photon process is you use a lower power light, so a longer wavelength, but you use it at really, really high concentration. And you can control that so you only get a high enough concentration of light happening at a very, very small spot to cause the cross to cause the, this liquid to turn into a solid. So rather like with two photon imaging, you can get very high resolution, you can see a very small spot. With two photon 3D printing, you can convert a very small bit of this liquid into a solid, which means you can 3D print at really, really high resolution. Now, these systems um, are available commercially. The one we use is a commercial system. It comes from a company called Nanoscribe um, in Germany. Um, they are um, they're certainly uh, they're quite specialist machines. They, they require a lot of specialist training, but they can turn out absolutely beautiful things. So let me, I'm going to see you through three things with 3D printed there <coughs> to give you an idea of what we can do. So the first generation of probe we, we looked at was, was shown down here in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, we, we 3D printed this small block. Now, the thing you can see there is an optical fiber, which is about 125, so 0.125 of a millimeter in diameter. This 3D printed block is about 300 microns by 600 microns. So it's still, still pretty small. We, but we got to 3D print a structure which had a small um, hole in it that we could poke a fiber into. So we could couple the fiber into there. Inside there, we 3D printed a mirror. So the mirror was actually just an air void. Um, and if you get the angle right, you get total internal reflections. The light bounces off and the light could bounce out the side. Because we were 3D printing, so we had a huge amount of control over the exact shapes that we were printing. Um, we could put a small um, curve on that mirror and use that to focus the light. So this is the first instance where someone had printed a, an object on the end of a fiber that they could use for OCT imaging. Um, and when we 3D print this, like each layer of our 3D print is about 100 nanometers. So you're, you're printing uh, beautifully small, small items here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, from there, our second generation probe was to print something directly onto the end of an optical fiber. And that's what you can see here. So we've zoomed up an awful lot here. Down the bottom of this picture, there is an optical fiber. So that's about, once again, 0.13, 0.12 of a millimeter across. So 130 microns. And then this structure on top is what we've 3D printed. There's two parts to this. One is we've got this angle here, <coughs> which is quite a sharp angle. And when the light comes up the fiber, it hits that and it totally internally reflects. So it bounces off to the side. So effectively we've used that to make a mirror. 
This structure here is our lens. And once again, because it's 3D printed, we can really control the shape of that. So this particular probe is going to be used intravascularly. So we're going to put this small probe inside a catheter and then put it inside a blood vessel. That catheter causes some distortion in the beam, and we could choose a shape that was going to pre-correct for that. So we could get really, really high resolution imaging. So this particular probe, we, um, we made our, our resolution was about 12 microns, and we could image over about one millimeter. Once again, beautiful for a, a lens that is this small. Um, I should probably point out the time to print this is quite slow. So to print this object took about 90 minutes. So, and there's a, there's a classic trade-off with 3D printing, which is if you get really high resolution, um, if you, you're, you're the thing you're printing is made up of lots and lots of little dots, um, it tends to be very slow to print. So it took about 90 minutes to print that structure. But that then goes inside a tube, inside a catheter, which we're going to put inside a blood vessel. There's a, a photo of our probe here on the left-hand side. You'll notice this, this metal coil. When you're trying to have a small imaging probe and you're putting inside something like a blood vessel or an airway or a colon, um, typically the light will come out the side. And so you just image one dot to the side. If you actually want to image the entire blood vessel, what you need to do is you need to spin it around so you can image all around you. Um, and fibers can spin, but they don't spin so well. So instead, we often put a metal coil around the fiber, which so that we can turn the metal coil and the fibers glued in there. And that's how we spin it around safely. So it's called a torque coil to transmit the torque of turning it around. That then goes inside the blood vessel and each, each rotation of it will generate one image at a particular spot across section limit across the blood vessel and that light will penetrate into the blood vessel a bit. So these white, bright white circles, that first bright white circle is where the light leaves the fiber. That second bright white circle is the catheter where some of the light bounces back. Then all this stuff here is going to about a millimeter into the blood vessel. Um, because we were able to make such a small lens here, we could make a very, very small intravascular, so blood vessel imaging probe. So this one, the, the outer diameter was less than half a millimetre, was the smallest intravascular probe. And in this instance, we were actually using it to image inside the blood vessel of a mouse. So in um, heart disease research, there are some really good mouse models of heart disease. And so we could actually image inside those mice to understand how the blood vessel, how the, um, the heart disease, the plaque is developing. So let me show you now the third generation, this is the, the latest thing we've been doing with 3D printing as, print, as we, we, our lens is getting more and more complicated here. So this is also a collaboration with the University of Stuttgart. What we're doing here is making a tiny, tiny probe that's doing both OCT and fluorescence imaging. So this is still looking around heart um, uh, intravascular imaging here. So imaging the heart, and it turns out there are some really useful fluorescent markers of heart disease. The particular design we're using here is, is the thing we're calling a lens in a lens. And so there's a, here's a photo of this, of this uh, lens. This is about 200 microns across. So these are really, really tiny things. The neat thing we're doing here is if you look at the, the type of lens we've got here, it's more complicated than just a simple lens. The problem we're addressing here is if you're doing OCT, and fluorescence imaging, you have very different demands on the optimal type of lens. So for OCT imaging, you want to, you want the light to be almost collimated, so not to be tightly focused, but to be sort of going a straight line to go as far as possible so you can see a long way. In fluorescence imaging, you want what they refer to as a very high numerical aperture, so, so, so that it, it can capture light from lots of different angles. And that's quite a different optical setup, and that, that gets you much better fluorescence sensitivity. So we've made this lens with two parts. The center bit here, is optimized for OCT imaging, so we can image over a long way. This section on the outside is uh, can capture light from lots of different angles, so we can capture an awful lot of the fluorescence imaging. So the really nice thing here is at this scale of 200 microns, we can mix and match different types of lenses to optimize so different types of imaging at the same time. And that is a capability that we never had before we had this sort of two photon uh, printing where we could actually make these sorts of intricate structures at this sort of scale. So that particular one, I've got a photo here of that in the metal coil that we use for spinning this around inside a blood vessel. Um, and we've now put that into the uh, blood vessel of a mouse and we've demonstrated that with that particular lens design, the OCT looks good and the fluorescence is about 14 times more sensitive um, than we would get with other lens designs. So something we can get a lot more sensitivity, we can pick up a lot more fluorescence. In this particular instance, we had a mouse where we injected ICG in the sign green um, because that is a fluorescent marker that tends to be absorbed into atherosclerotic plaques. These are lesions on blood vessels that happen in heart disease. And so they allow us to help identify these lesions. Um, let me just briefly sort of tell you some of the under the hood stuff around 3D printing. Um, so 3, 3D printing is a great area 
to develop into. Um, what's great about 3D printing, especially two photon printing at, at this sort of scale, is you can print really complex shapes. So things that at this size, you just could not fabricate in any other way, you can suddenly do. So there are a lot, and that creates a lot of new opportunities in the work that researchers are doing. So for example, the particular lens designs we're doing, we could fabricate that if it was a big lens, a thing you could hold in your hands, but we could never make those sorts of shapes at small. So two photon printing allows us to take ideas from big world and recreate them in small world. And so there's a lot of really good ideas that we can translate over at a scale that we couldn't do before. Also, this technology is developing rapidly. So there are a lot of companies that are working on it. Um, there are a lot of research labs working on it. So many of the problems that we have with it, um, people are really actively working on that and there are great improvements coming there. Um, <coughs> there are challenges around 3D printing that can make it a pain. One of the big things there is 3D printing is really slow. There is this trade-off that if you print at really high resolution, it's really slow to do it. So that tiny structure on the end of an optical fiber that I showed you took 90 minutes to print. That first generation structure, that big block that we printed, that was 0.3 of a millimeter by 0.6 of a millimeter, that took us 14 and a half hours to print. Now, there are different ways that they're working on trying to speed up 3D printing. Um, and a lot of these either come down to doing things in parallel. So if you print lots of them, it doesn't matter if it takes a long time or some sort of trade-off of resolution and speed. But fundamentally, if you're printing things at really high resolution, they will be slow to print. In the case of these sorts of printers, they're also really complex to use. So something like a, a Formlabs uh, 3D printer um, is like, it's a beautifully engineered device because that's really, you know, it can just come out of a box and it'll, it'll work first time. And you can you can drop one of those Formlabs printers into a, into a you know, biology lab or into a, a clinical site and they will use it and they use it successfully very, very quickly. These very high resolution printers, so things like the Nanoscribe, are much more complicated to use. And so you really need someone, you need an engineer or a physicist who has a really good understanding of the optics and a really good understanding of all the mechanisms that are going here to make that thing work at the, um, at the level that it should. So they're not just out of the box. You've really got to understand what they're doing. So they're, they're not just turnkey technologies. However, if you do understand them, you can 3D print beautiful things. A way that works for us um, for around that is collaborating. So we work with the uh, researchers at the University of Stuttgart who, who have a huge amount of expertise around this printing. And we find that since working with them, the quality of the things that we're able to develop and print really improves. So we we'll work with, so partner with someone who really understands 3D printing. Um, <coughs> In the case of optics, um, one, of the, one of the gotchas for us was also being really aware of some of the nuances of the printing where you can get discontinuity. So as an example, for this big block we printed, and I say big, it's still only you know, 0.3 of a millimetre by, by 0.6 of a millimetre, um, 3D printers couldn't print structures that are that big. They really want to print things that are under 300 microns in size. So for this block, we had to 3D print one block, and then it has a small translation stage that moves that block over, and you 3D print the next block. When you do that movement, things don't exactly stitch together. There can be the slightest imperceivable um, impure imperfection where those two blocks join up. But in the case of optics, that, that can cause you all sorts of defects. So when we originally designed this, you can see the design in the bottom right-hand corner, that stitching of those blocks happened halfway through our mirror. And suddenly we got a whole lot of weird artifacts in our imaging. So if you're printing slightly larger items, you need to be very thoughtful about where any discontinuities can happen. And this really comes down to, to 3D print interesting complex shapes, you do have to have quite a good understanding of the mechanisms of exactly how it works so that you don't get caught with some of the, the details of, of how it does things. So to summarize what we've been talking about today, I've been largely talking about a particular imaging technology called optical coherence tomography. Um, and because informally you can think of it as like ultrasound with light, it's uh, looking at backscattered light. Um, in particular, um, we've been looking at how we make really small fiber optic probes. These largely come down to putting a lens on the end of a fiber and then imaging through that. Um, we recognize that um, a particular instance in blood vessel avoidance in brain surgery, because OCT is really good at differentiating blood vessels from stationary tissue. We also saw how you could put multiple different types of light down these probes. So you could do potentially OCT and fluorescence imaging. And also once you can do fluorescence, you can suddenly start uh, open up the world of fluorescence sensing onto these fiber probes that you can put into obscure places. And finally, we're starting to look at how we're using 3D printing to 3D print these really, really complicated shapes, which we can use as lenses to do imaging on our fiber probes and get much, much better quality images. <coughs>
So to finish up, um, I'd like to like I, I, I'm I'm lucky to be part of an incredible team who actually do all the hard work here uh, that I get to talk about. Um, we also have an extensive list of collaborators who also make the clinical applications possible, and all the technical stuff we do possible, and um, and a large number of funding bodies that, that that keep keep the wheels working. So guys, thank you very much. And are there any questions? Um, thanks, Rob, for the fantastic talk. Um, you really brought us from from optics to brain and to 3D printing. <laughs> it's a pretty, pretty big spread of, of technologies and, and application. So I'll start off with a few questions. And for those on, on the call, you could either type your questions in the chat or, or you know unmute and, and ask. So I have three questions to start off. Um, the first is you, you talk a little bit, a lot about this intricacy in 3D printing. Um, and I guess, um, can I ask what are the intricacies? Is that the chemistry involved in understanding polymerization or the optics uh, when you want to print a, you know, a massive complicated structure? Um, so both of them impact what you can do um, and both of them can result in, in artifacts in your imaging. So the, the chemistry of that will change, will really impact the resolution you can print, print to. Um, the optics, um, because you 3D print things as a layered structure, those layered structures can cause little artifacts in the imaging. Because in, in optics, in optics, we we like nice uh, uh, nice homo uh, homogeneous uh, materials that our light can go through. We don't like when things change. So if our fundamental part of 3D printing is to make little layers that we layer on top of each other, there's always a danger that there's some sort of um, uh, inconsistency between those layers. So uh, and and in 3D printing, it works really well, um, uh, but there is a mixture of those that sort of catch you on the edges. And, and I think the message here is that when you use that higher caliber of 3D printing, because you're printing things of sort of, you know, the, the scales, of, scales of, of wavelengths of light, the details really, really do matter. Whereas for, for other 3D printing, like your, your much larger scale stuff, it's, it's a bit more rough and ready and doesn't matter so much. Um, once again, you can still work with these, but our experience was that when we work, when we partner with people who really, really understood the magic inside the box, we were able to suddenly push the bounds of, of what we could do with 3D printing. And as researchers, we're often there always trying to push the technology a little bit more like, you know, can I have different types of materials, which is possible, or could I 3D print um, a moving part in there somehow, something that can actually move around. Yeah, I guess you're saying that there's a lot of inhomogeneity if you have the incorrect <laughs> mixture of photochemistry and, and, and two photon wavelength absorption. So that would generate inhomogeneity and that causes error, is it, am I understanding? Um, you will, so, so they, they, correct, they correct for stuff in, incredibly well in terms of, of uh, correcting for uh, challenges around the, um, uh, around the materials. Um, yeah, so, so probably a, a, nice, a nice example of, of some of the details you, you need to be thoughtful of. Um, let me show you the first thing we the first thing we 3D printed was we had a we had a lens we had a, a mirror in here now a mirror was just an air void so we basically effectively in this block we had a gap that was just left with air and because we had air we got total internal reflection the thing back functioned in the mirror now because we wanted to have a void in there we actually when we 3D printed this and designed this had to have some holes so that when you 3D print it the fluid in there that we didn't want yes. there could actually rain out because that didn't get polymerized. So that's a nice example of where when you're thinking about, okay, so I've got a liquid, I need it to get out because I want air to, air to be in there. I need the, the drainage holes not to be in the direction of the light beam. So sort of thinking through that, there can be, and that's based on the way that we 3D print it will force us, if we want to do particular types of shapes, we have to do them in particular ways. I see, great. Uh, I think Liz has a question. <clears throat> Oh, thanks, Steve. Um, you, you've still got two questions. No, I'll let you go first because uh, right. there's more optics. <laughs> Rob, thank you. That was amazing. I learned so much. How far away are we from being able to sample in blood vessels the way that you could measure pH with your, the cystic fibrosis model, for example? Could, can, could you sample a, um, a plaque, for example, and look at plasmin? activity or um, amount of fibrin, something like that? Um, 
So for imaging that inside the plaque is more challenging because we don't want to poke our fibres into there. The model here will be we have the small optical fibre in, in a catheter. Let me um, go to a, a picture of one of those, which we thread inside the blessed vessel and then we shine the light inside the plaque. Um, some of the work that um, we're doing is we're looking at different types of fluorescent sensors that will bind to particular things like be taken up by macrophages so that we can shine light into the plaque. And if it glows a lot, we know we know that it's a, it's a particular type of plaque. So that really comes down to are there fluorescent sensors for identifying the different types of chemicals that you want. So we're, we're sort of making the optics so that we can get the probe there and take the picture. One right. of the things working with the collaborators is the right sort of sensors that are going to make things glow when the right chemicals are in there. Uh, but the, uh, probably the, the, the key thing we're doing right now is, is making these, these dual probes that both see where the plaque is, that's the OCT, and also have this, this possibility for looking at fluorescence so we can get some sort of chemical composition. Okay, so Steve has a project in his group um, looking at um, uh, collagen uh, using optics it's without the need for staining it. I'll let him talk more about it, but um, this would be an ideal application of it. Okay. Thank you, really exciting, thank you. Thanks. Um, anyone have any more questions? If not, I'll continue with my. Uh. <laughs> I have several questions. So awesome. Rob, yeah, thank yeah. you for, for your beautiful talk. It's exciting to see your team and your collaborators are, bring, are bridging optics and bring diagnosis. So my question is, uh, I'm interested in the penetration limitation. Is that possible to use like longer image little or like longer fiber plus micro optics to, to push the limitation? Yeah, it's a great question. So, so the thing that limits, the limit we've got is when the light starts hitting the tissue, it only usefully goes a particular distance. And that's nothing to do with the power of the light. So if we turn the light up, we don't get to see further. What happens is when the light goes into the tissue, it scatters. So it, it hits, a, hits a, a cell and it bounces off somewhere, then it bounces off somewhere else. And after we've got about one to two millimeters in tissue, light has bounced around so much that the light that makes it back to us um, is very confused and the image is just very noisy. We also find as we go deeper, less of the light actually makes it back to us because it just bounces off to the side. So the issue here is because the light scatters, once the light hits the tissue, it usefully only goes about one or two millimeters in, then it's got to make all the way back. And any further than that, the light gets bounced around too much. So one of the problems there is that it means that um, so changing the wavelength can modify that a bit, but that sort of those wavelengths we use are probably about the best trade-off of scattering and, and absorption. So you're going to be limited to about that. There are some people who've done some work on like, can I make tissue more transparent? Can I do a thing called optical clearing? Um, which is a, a decent approach, but also so not necessarily feasible if you're deep inside someone's body, you can't put in extra chemicals to make it clearer. Um, and that's why our focus has really been, okay, we can't see further than about one or two millimeters in OCT. What we can do is we can get closer to the thing we want to see. And that's why we will put our probe into a needle and stab it in and take it right up to the area we want to image. So we're within one or two millimeters or make these sorts of flexible probes that they actually go inside blood vessels. So the, the, like I said, the approach of just get close enough to the thing you want to see is um, what we're finding is allowing us to bring OCT to a whole lot of new areas. So clinically, OCT is used really, really commonly in ophthalmology. The eye is great, right? So looking at the eye, and every, every major hospital is going to have a few OCT systems in their ophthalmology unit for looking at the eye. The eye is great because light goes through the eye, which is why you can see. Um, clinically, it's also very commonly used for cardiology for looking at atherosclerotic plaques. And what we're enabling by making these small probes that we can poke into places is suddenly taking this ophthalmology and cardiology technology to a whole lot of diseases where we just haven't been able to get the light to before. Cool, thank you. We have audience. <laughs> we have questions um, so for audience. It's a question. Um, like there's one comment that uh, it's for you, I think, about uh, applying some of the 3D printing for uh, astronomy applications uh, from, from Israel. A uh, second comment from Thomas Cobb, uh, a question is, can you develop a probe that include a small capillary to lo locally deliver agents, such as reporters or probes, fluorescent probes during imaging? Yep, and so uh, some earlier work we did, we, we made a needle which had two holes in it um, and we left a little channel for putting fluid through. So we made a, we made a small needle which we could image out of one hole and had a second hole that we could pu pump fluid through. Um, and the idea is there you could either pump fluid through like you pump some sort of contrast agent, potentially you could suck things in if you were trying to take a sampling of tissue. And probably most interestingly, you could potentially um, selectively pump a therapeutic drug in. So the, the concept we had there was we could use 
OCT to decide when the needle's in the right spot, excuse me, and then we could pump out some sort of therapeutic drug to the second hole so we know that it only goes to the area that it wants to rather than going systemically. So that's very, and that, that really just comes down to sort of microfabrication, how good you are at working with small stuff, um, but you can utterly have a second tube into these sorts of probes running parallel to the fiber that's either going to pump fluid in or suck fluid out. Cool. Um, I'll, I'll just lead on to the next question. Do, do, uh, you've worked with green lenses and as you showed that earlier and then 3D printing. Um, just a comment from you, do you think that 3D printing, if it's, fast enough, would it replace green lens technology in general in the future? Um, for a lot of things. Um, so the, the 3D printing just gives you so many more capabilities when it's fast enough. Um, you can print, uh, you can really nuance and customize it to the exact optics you want. So that's why we're, we're really excited and working that area. For a lot of the applications that we work on, what we do with a little bit of green fiber um, is good enough. Um, and if it's good enough, and if it's if it's simpler to produce at scale, then that's a really, really good application. So there's a couple of commercial applications we're working on with our needles where the green fiber lens um, really doesn't cause us any limitations. So I think you have the potential with 3D printing to print superior lenses. For some applications, you don't need superior lenses and um, producing the green fiber based lenses can be a, can be a thing we can do very really reproducibly um, and that is often is good enough. So. Uh, I think there's, there's a lot of scope in the 3D printing. It's not necessary for every application we do. Let's see. Thanks. Yep. Anyone's? Oh, Daniel's got a question. Yep. Hi. Uh, thanks. Um, so I have a few questions about mostly 3D printing because um, that's what I'm interested in. But I was wondering, um, what I guess what compound do you use for the lithography process? Yeah, I'm so the with the nanoscribe that we use, it's all proprietary compounds. So I, I don't know the chemicals of that. Um, you can certainly certainly track down what information you can. It is, I think generally it's a it's a it's a photoresist that's cross-linked in the um, uh, in the UV range, I think. Um, and their two photon processes um, you know, sort of can come up to the right power of light. Um, but they tend to be quite uh, relatively protected around the details around that because there's a there's a lot of IP in how you make those chemicals. Right. Um, so I guess, well, I guess it's quite a uh, match to refractive index of the, of the glass there to avoid the aberrations. Um, yeah, and there are different refractive yeah. indexes that they can, that I think that they can use in these photoresists depending because the, the optics applications are just one application they're looking at with this sort of uh, multi-photon lithography. There are a whole lot of other things there, 3D printing, but for me, the, the optics potential. So they certainly have photoresists that are really good for optics, um, uh, but they have other ones which are, which are, uh, are not optics based as well. All right. And how do you attach um, the three D printed end to your um, probe? So is it also by splicing? Um, no. So so we've done a couple of things. This on that that first first one uh, first generation probe we did. We actually um, left in a small cavity, a small hole that was shaped just so it was just slightly larger than the fiber. Um, and in that case, we put a little bit of glue and we we poked we poked the fiber in there. Um, the reason we did that is we put a, a slight angle on the end because we wanted a very small air gap. Um, in OCT, sometimes it's useful to put uh, an additional reflection into the, the path of the light. For this one, we did because it was a common path of OCT. So we specifically wanted to leave this tiny, tiny air gap. So we left this, left, left a, uh, we, we made a hole that we poked the fiber into. Um, what we do now is we 3D print directly onto the fiber and we find the photoresist does actually adhere to it very strongly. So we, you know, if you, if you rub it, the, the photoresist won't come on. So it naturally does stick to it. So for this one, our colleagues in Stuttgart have a particular fitting where they can put, they can mount a fiber into their nanoscribe printer and 3D print directly onto the surface of the fiber. And we find that is a, um, probably more reproducible and also it removes a whole sort of extra step in the manufacture because you 3D print it on, it's in the right place. You're not trying to align these things afterwards. So that's very much the way forward for us, 3D printing directly onto the end of the fiber. Oh, okay, that's, that's very interesting. Um, yeah, um, and for the lenses, is that something that you also design in terms of the optics of how it um, converges on the optics? Yep. Um, yeah. Yep, and that's and and I think the, um, the the most recent one is a really example of where you can get quite um, involved in those designs, um, and you can because you've got and, and really that's the 
for us, the exciting thing with 3D printing is we've got so much control that we can 3D print shapes that are really customized to lots of different different aspects of optics. So, so we, we do a lot of work, especially I know with our colleagues in Stuttgart, in the in the detailed design of what these are with 3D printing, we can suddenly fabricate these crazy shapes. Oh, interesting, interesting. Thanks. Yep, um, any questions? Yeah. So Robert, so the surface, it looks very smooth. Do you lead to any actual processing to make the surface smooth uh, in, on top of like the two photon polarization? You can, you so you can do a little bit of processing afterwards. Um, with these ones, I don't think we did. And I know with the um, the, the previous ones that we had, we didn't have to do any, any processing. Um, I think the, um, the layer thickness was something like 100 nanometers, and there's a little bit of sort of smoothing that happens automatically when you print onto there as, as things are here together. Um, but we didn't have to do any processing on these ones, and we didn't find really that there are any optical defects happening from that. We also characterized the smoothness of that lens. When you characterize, when you did a profilometry and looked at the smoothness of the lens, you could slightly see the um, see the um, little bumps from the layers but they were below the diffraction limit. So they're sufficiently small that they were not impact, impacting our optics in the near infrared. So it's, it's really, um, if your printer is set up correctly, um, you can print impressively smooth things. Cool, thank you. So any questions, anyone? Um, I'll lead on to the next question. I guess uh, it's quite fascinating the two lens approach that you had, the design factor, and I guess you have to model that before you print it. So, do you, what sort of modeling? Absolutely. So that was that was all, all modeled ahead of time in Zmax, so we could really understand what. And we explored a number of different different um, um, optical designs around there. And this is uh, so that particular one is is a paper in process. So that that paper will hopefully be submitted within the next couple of weeks, and then we can. We can release all, all the details of that particular one. So that's an example of showing under the hood of stuff that we haven't quite published yet. Um, but we we model all that in Zmax to come up with the design, and then we um, that was what we put into the three D printer. And, and, and how accurate is the outcome? Just a quick. Without, um, without revealing the results. So yeah, yeah, bottom, bottom line, it's 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 really accurate. Um, it it does what it said on the box. So um, it's impressive that once again, as long as you've got a three D printer working well and people who understand what they're working with, um, uh, the thing that you print really does match the thing that you put in. Um, so that we have been, I've been generally my experience with uh, the work we've done the nanoscribe is, is a beautiful bit of engineering. It is extremely high quality. You do have to, I say, well, it's not just a turnkey thing. You do really have to have a, a decent understanding of the physics and the optics and everything that's going on to, to do stuff well. But it really does 3D print impressive things. I, I see. I, I guess my question was really the optical performance. So if you do ZMAX model versus and, and you've done that printing, how accurate? Is that yeah, it was, it was it was it was in the it was in the, absolutely in the ballpark of what we would have expected to be. Um, when we are fabricating things at this scale, um, there is also some always some variation, um, and we get that with our green fiber probes as well because we might um, get the length of one of the fibers you know wrong by three or four microns, and and that will suddenly change the optics a bit. But for what we've experienced of when you're printing it, when you're fabricating at this sort of tiny tiny scale, um, we were really impressed. We felt that the 3D printed lenses were far more reproducible than when we spliced little bits of fiber together. So I'd say it was probably the most reproducible of the fabrication methods that we use for making these very small lenses. Cool. Uh, there's a question in the uh, uh, audience. Uh, Evan Nash asked, is it always advantageous to use a side facing lens in a different, uh, in different biological environments? It it really does depend on your application. So to make a forward facing lens is a bit easier because you don't have to have some sort of mirror mechanism on the front. And there are times when that's useful. So we made some needle probes for insertion where the idea was that as you inserted the needle forward, you wanted to know before you hit a blood vessel. So that was an instance of where we just had a forward facing, um, facing uh, probe. The value of having a side facing thing is if you want to create a picture of what you're looking at, um, by, uh, I got a fiber, if I've got light coming out the side, if I rotate that fiber, I suddenly get a 2D picture in the, in the plane that I am. And as I move this thing forward, I can build up a whole 3D volume of the tissue that I'm moving for, moving through. So if I want to get an image of it, I really need side facing because then I can move that and draw out a picture. 
If I'm only forward facing, I can only see the, the particular bits that are directly ahead of me. And then as I move forward, I'm just gonna see more of those. So I'll never actually be able to make out an image of the tissue. So if we wanna see the structure of things, side facing is important, not necessary for every application, um, but and it really does depend on like, do I need to see the structure of the tissue or do I just wanna distance measure myself to a thing that's directly ahead of me? Great. Any more questions? Oh, there's a new message. Yep. Uh, Evan says, thank you. Um, any other questions? Um, sorry, I do have a just quick follow up on that. Okay. Um, so when you rotate the, uh, the fiber, is that, um, and you stitch it together, is, so is that really um, automated by, me by mechanics? So using like a, a motorized uh, rotator or is that, or is the stitching done all, or is that done manually and then you stitch it together um, post-processing? Yeah, great, great question. Um, different things in different applications. So in when we're putting one of these small fiber probes inside a blood vessel and we spin around, we're, we're spinning around with the motor um, and then we, we know how far that we've spun it each time. So we can, we can, we can easily stitch that together because we know where partic each particular image was taken. Um, we have an instance where we have a, uh, an imaging needle. Um, this is a side facing needle where we put that into muscle. Um, and in that particular instance, we don't have a translation stage to put it in a really controlled way. We actually just have a handheld needle that we stab into the muscle. Um, and then we don't, we don't get to control the speed. You can still reconstruct that. So you can still stitch together all the pictures, even if you don't know the speed that you were moving the probe at, um, based on some of the, um, the noise characteristics of the OCT. So just to sort of geek out for a second, um, there's this particular noise in OCT called speckle, which are these sort of this grainy, dark and bright bits. Um, in OCT, the speckle is often considered as noise, but actually it's not, it's got information. And statistically, the speckle has a very particular size, which is set by the optics. So if I have a needle which I stab into some muscle, by analysing the speckle, I can actually work out how fast the needle was. And so in post-processing, I can put this image back together, even if I had no control of the speed at which I inserted it. So where possible, we, we try and have the control with the motor. Sometimes it's not, and then we can do some post-processing to put the images together. All right, thanks. Any other questions? Um, um, if not, I think that's a, that's a fantastic um, 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 overview of, of mini props. Um, I hope we can buy from you sometime in the future. <laughs> uh, uh, I hope that's in the market on eBay or I don't know, even a website we can, we can get to. <laughs> So I've got to say the, the, the journey as a company is a, is a separate talk and a, and a really, as, a, as an academic, a really interesting one. We, we originally started making some of our needle probes for the research market uh, until we re realized that um, there's actually, there's not a large enough market and researchers never have enough money. What we've since realized is um, we've identified some specific um, applications for this. There's, there's a particular one, in, especially in the ag tech market, where our imaging needles are actually actually the perfect solution for the problem they've got. Um, and so now that, that company is working on not building just these pros, but building entire systems for, for, um, for sale. So but that's certainly, as an academic, that's been a, a separate and, and just as interesting journey and learning journey for me. Awesome. All right. Um, so, yep. Thank you everyone for, for staying on, on the chat. Um, um, I guess, uh, yeah, have, have a great day ahead uh, or great evening. Uh, in, Guys, thank, thank you everyone for joining us. Thanks very much for listening. Yeah, thank fantastic. You. Thank you, Robert. Thanks everyone. Hope to see everyone in our next section, in our next yes, lecture. <laughs> next <laughs> month. All right, see you. Bye. Bye.